Namaskar and welcome to yet another episode of Around the World with me, Pankaj Saran. I am joined once again by Atir Khan, Tripti Nath and Asha Khosa who are going to ask me questions on our topic for today. In the last episode, we discussed Pakistan. Before that, we discussed China. But today, we will talk about our other neighbours. We will discuss the significance of the government's neighbourhood first policy. Who are our neighbours? What makes them so special? Do we know them as well as we should? What do our neighbours think of us? And how do our neighbours affect our security and safety? We will discuss these and other questions in this episode of Around the World. We will talk about the recent visit of the Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to India, developments in Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, and the Maldives. Our goal is to bring you analysis of global developments that is simple, independent, objective, but yet has an authentic Indian perspective. So let us dive straight into today's discussion and thank you once again for joining us. Ambassador Saran, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had invited leaders of neighboring countries for a swearing in ceremony which was held at the Rashpati Bhavan. It's been eight years now. How do you see his gesture translating diplomacy? Yeah, you know, the decision was historic. Uh, never ever had the leaders of the South Asian countries been invited. And it indicated uh, a very, very powerful uh, sentiment on behalf of the newly elected government in India that uh, they were ready to look beyond the borders of India to their immediate neighborhood. And they wanted to involve the neighbors in the celebrations that were taking place in India with the election results and the swearing in of uh, the new Prime Minister, uh, Sri Narendra Modi. So it was a very, very uh, bold decision. And they all uh, reciprocated and they all came and they all attended uh, that event. And it was in the forecourt and it was a brilliant ceremony. Since then, the Prime Minister has visited every single neighbour of India during his Prime Ministership. In some cases, he has visited more than once. And he also visited Pakistan in December 2015 when he was flying back from Afghanistan uh, to India. He stopped in Lahore because Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif invited him to attend the wedding of his uh, granddaughter. And he was there for a few hours. And uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif came to the airport to receive him. So that message that went out from our Prime Minister was that he as an individual, as a leader, his government, the country is ready to uh, stretch its hand out to build a new relationship with Pakistan, with the new elections in India. But unfortunately, what has happened is, that uh, we find um, uh, after that visit, we saw Uri and we saw Pathan Kot and we saw Pulwama. So there were forces in Pakistan which were uh, not yet ready to allow this process to continue. And so they mounted these terrorist attacks on Indian installations and military installations. And uh, that put the whole process back uh, to square one. So that was uh, what happened in the case of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But if you leave that aside, because then the government decided after all this was happening, that maybe the best course is to leave Pakistan alone. Let them decide what they want to do with themselves and with us. Because there is no point in wasting effort mm -hmm. in trying to build a relationship only to time and again be uh, taken back uh, so you move one step forward and you're taking two steps uh, backwards. So that was, I think, the sense that, you know, you first decide you want to pursue the path of terrorism and unending hostility with India, or do you want to turn a new leaf in the page of our relationship? But minus that, if you look at the other neighbors, the neighborhood first policy has uh, moved very fast. 
and today we have very dense and very uh, complex relationships with all the other neighbors and you know the, dealing with our neighbors is by itself uh, a complex exercise you know you have two tiny himalayan states like nepal and bhutan you have uh, states right down in the indian ocean maldives and sri lanka you have uh, myanmar on your eastern which is uh, neighboring your northeast region and then you have two countries pakistan and bangladesh which were actually born from british india so it's a complex neighborhood but we have pursued and we have achieved good results we've spent about 14 billion dollars in uh, lines of credit for the neighborhood we have we've actually uh, tailor made our approaches to each neighbor differently mm-hmm. so for example we've spent 3 billion dollars to build the infrastructure of afghanistan we've given 8 billion dollars of credit line to bangladesh uh, we have helped the myanmar government in the rakhine state to build houses and improve its infrastructure similarly in 2015 when there was a massive earthquake in nepal we were the first to go in to assist and help uh, nepal and uh, most recently in the case of sri lanka when they've had this financial emergency we've uh, lent almost close to 4 billion dollars to their economy to help it uh, revive so uh, in the case of bhutan for example uh we have another model of cooperation where we import hydroelectricity from bhutan so it gives them income and it gives us electricity similarly in the case of the maldives for example it's basically it's a, it's a very vulnerable country uh vulnerable to climate change and to global warming but we've helped them with all those aspects of climate change we've helped them to build port infrastructure so with different countries we've adopted different approaches and then you know you know what happened during the covid era i mean the amount of assistance we gave we helped our neighbors with provision of essential commodities we facilitated people to people contacts uh, travel by air by land by sea so we tried to build a region around us of the indian subcontinent mm. which can move forward together with india on the path of prosperity and safety and security right. ambassador saran uh, i'm sorry to take you back to pakistan though we decided we'll not speak much about pakistan but i guess that's inevitable uh, pakistan knows our intention uh, through gestures and through the stated policy that we are ready to cooperate with uh, pakistan we are ready to you know have include it in our neighborhood policy you know, neighborhood outreach right now the conditions may not be conducive to having a relationship with india but maybe now or maybe in the future since the intention has been conveyed and we stand by our 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 policy how will it change or how it is it it is changing uh, you know our relations with pakistan or impacting our relations with pakistan yeah you know as i said i mean when prime minister visited uh, lahore in december 2015 he was making a big statement but i think the pakistani establishment misunderstood that gesture and uh, the army in pakistan and the intelligence agencies basically have to introspect and and kind of come to terms with how they want to deal with india till that is not done unfortunately we will not be able to move forward with pakistan in the manner in which two normal states interact and this is a call which pakistan has to take you know we have done nothing to pakistan nothing i mean even when in 2019 all that we did was to amend an indian constitution we did not do anything internationally it was an indian constitution and we amended it and that led to such furor in pakistan for reasons which are not understood and they basically recalled the high commissioners they stopped your trade i mean they went to all lengths to stop all normal interaction with india so you know that is the reality that we are confronted with and till such time as they are trying to walk on two pillars or on two legs the the path of terrorism and the terrorist groups and the proxy groups which are functioning and operating and on the other hand using kashmir as uh, Uh, as a means to con- continue to whip up 
uh, anti-Indian uh, hysteria. And uh, then also talk about the fact that you're ready for a dialogue. It doesn't happen that way. I mean, you have to basically make up your mind. And uh, uh, yes, we have had a ceasefire, and which is holding now for the last one, one and a half, two years. So it shows it is possible to actually find a way to deal with each other. But you have to go further than that. And it shows that there are opportunities, there are possibilities. I mean, we are always optimists. But in this particular case, uh, unfortunately, Pakistan is not able to show uh, fresh thinking or forward looking thinking. And they seem to be stuck in time. And that is something which is more a reflection, I would say, of the elite and the mindset. And until and unless that mindset changes, uh, any medium or long term uh, breakthroughs with India uh, are difficult. We are ready. Uh, we are ready to have this bilateral relationship with Pakistan, which we can uh, move and use to help our peoples because uh, everyone in the subcontinent mm, is more or less uh, faced with the same challenges, whether in the economy or on climate or uh, development or women's empowerment. Uh, we are all more or less in the same boat. Uh, but uh, the Pakistani elite and the establishment, uh, it is important for them to come to terms. And till such time, I think uh, there is nothing much we can do. Yeah, Master uh, sir. You know, India has been playing the a big brotherly role in the region very well. But we have seen normally, you know, usually Pakistan doesn't reciprocate India's kind gestures or initiatives. When, uh, you know, when uh, Prime Minister uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee tried to reach out uh, to Parvez Musharraf, he got Kargil in return. Then again, when the Prime Minister goes uh, for an unscheduled visit, to meet uh, Nawaz Sharif for uh, wedding the family, we get Pathan court. So, why is it that you know every time India tries to reach out to Pakistan, uh, we get uh, you know this hostile kind of reaction from the other side? Yeah, yeah, I think it is structural. I think they have to come to terms with their identity. They have to change their strategic mindset, uh, and uh, there has to be some real, genuine thinking within their system on what they should give priority to. Do they want to be, uh, they, do they want to continue to be in the role of a state that uses and harbors and finances and promotes terror and terror groups? Do they want that label on them forever? Or do they want to distance themselves from that whole business of international and cross-border terrorism? They have to make up their mind. Because history has shown that the path that they have followed so far has not been good for them. And therefore, today they are facing this uh, uh, multiple crises in their uh, country's history, for which the solutions lie only within Pakistan. And the international community is also showing signs of impatience and fatigue about uh, how to you know, move this whole matter forward. Yeah. So I think the answer to your question is, is just that, that they have to, uh, their people, the, the elites and those who matter, which is basically the army, and the armed forces, uh, who make India policy, they have to come to terms with uh, how they want to deal with India. Ambassador Saran, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi invested his out-of-the-box thinking that we are now very familiar with in enunciating a neighborhood-first policy, it was uh, very well hailed not just in India, but even in world capitals. Uh, over a period of time, uh, we are now in the 36th year of SARC, but over a period of time, there has been thinking in foreign think tanks and uh, by some seasoned diplomats that uh, the neighborhood first policy has overshadowed SARC and the relevance of SARC has got diluted. Uh, many visionary projects have not really uh, had the desired impact, for instance, the SARC Satellite Project, the SARC Development Fund, the SARC Motor Vehicles Agreement, the establishment of the SARC Environment and Management Center, uh, the SARC Free Trade Agreement, which was signed in 2004, has also not lived up to its hype. So how should the government strike a balance uh, between 
the noble objectives of SARC and its neighborhood first policy. You know, look, uh, what was the purpose of SARC? The purpose of SARC was to promote subcontinental integration among all the countries of South Asia. That was the basic purpose. And SARC was meant to be that vehicle which will allow all this to happen. And it functioned, as you are right, that many of the initiatives taken by SARC failed to materialize. And the basic problem and the reason behind all this is the Pakistani obduracy to allow normal SARC institutions and initiatives to go forward. I mean, in their blinding hostility to India, uh, they were ready to sacrifice the noble objectives of SARC. And uh, the last summit was held in 2014 in Nepal, for which Prime Minister Modi had gone. But then for eight years, you've not had a summit meeting. And if you notice, uh, in India, the view is that I will not wait for SARC to move my agenda forward if the other countries are ready and willing and desirous of moving much faster with India in our relationships. Why should I hold myself back? So if I can do better outside the SARC framework with all my countries in the region, either bilaterally or sub-regionally, like say BIMSTEC or BBIN, I will do it. So I will create what is called the coalition of the willing. That if there are willing countries, willing partners, I will go full steam forward. So I would say that approach is actually proving to be very productive mm -hmm. and it is showing concrete results on the ground. And uh, uh, so the net result is because of the success of the neighborhood first policy and how it is being reciprocated by the rest of the neighbors, today no one is missing SARC in India or in the region for that matter. And there is no real great um, campaign uh, for SARC. Of course, we are members of SARC. When conditions are ripe and appropriate, uh, we will go forward with it. But we will not allow uh, Pakistan to hold us back in this noble task of integrating our region and making it more prosperous and more secure. No one is missing SARC. That's a very quote-worthy observation. But then how do you explain uh, expression of interest by some countries like Myanmar and, uh, you know, uh, Turkey and Russia to still get on board SARC as observers? Yeah. So, uh, uh, as far as Myanmar is concerned, I mean, they were, they asked and they got observership uh, in SARC. And that was a very good decision. And in fact, we were uh, all in support of that uh, request. But even in the case of Myanmar, if we let's talk about Myanmar, I mean, the relation, India's relationship with Myanmar is a complex relationship. You know, on the one hand, uh, you have your values of democracy, human rights, uh, respect for rule of law. And on the other hand, you have your vital national security interests because Myanmar borders your northeastern states. It is a hotbed of uh, ethnic rivalries. Uh, and fault lines, uh, underdevelopment. But even despite all that, and despite uh, the internal contradictions within Myanmar, our relationship with them has increased very, very significantly, both under the previous government of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, when she was elected, and uh, even when we had non-military, non-civilian uh, governments, and even with the military of Myanmar, because for us, Let's face it, uh, ensuring the security of our own country in the Northeast is critical. It is true for every country in the world. I mean, every country in the world, for them, the first priority is maintaining territorial integrity and security of their borders. So if I have serious problems on, say, weapon smuggling, the movement of insurgents across the border, uh, narcotic smuggling, uh, trafficking, etc. I have to deal with them. So, in addition to the Myanmar, uh, to the bilateral track with Myanmar, we are dealing with Myanmar through the BIMSTEC framework, in the Bay of Bengal context, in the Andaman Sea, 
uh, we have coastal shipping arrangements, we are doing military training exercises. So we are doing everything. We have development projects. So I think that is basically it reinforces the previous point that we were making that uh, yes, if it was, it would have been very nice to have a good, healthy SARC model of cooperation. But absent that, we are going ahead with others, including Myanmar. Sure. Ambassador Sarum, do you think uh, uh, India's neighborhood first policy needs course correction in certain areas? I don't think so. I think it's an excellent framework, you know, because uh, it basically forces the government to take a whole of government approach to the neighborhood. You know, when we say, let us pick up any country, like say Bhutan or Nepal, you know, there are so many issues with these countries. Firstly, in both cases, you don't need visas, right? In the case of Bhutan, India has funded, say, hydroelectric projects. We import electricity from Bhutan. Uh, in the case of the Nepalese, they can work in India. So there are cross-cutting issues from the Indian side, which affect our home ministry, our power ministry, our water ministry. So <clears throat> the neighborhood first policy has facilitated and enabled the entire government of India, along with the bordering states, to take a holistic view and approach to our neighbors. So I think it's a very good uh, framework. Mm -hmm. And we have had some very good success stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say uh, Bangladesh is one of the best success stories. We'll discuss it. But there are other stories. I mean, uh, because of the neighborhood first policy, we have been able to participate and assist and lend a helping hand to our neighbors at times of emergency, whether it was a natural disaster or during the time of the COVID, we were there ready to help them. Uh, we have been able to build connectivities. We today have uh, cross-border electricity connections. Uh, we have uh, revival of the inland waterways. Uh, we have uh, several flights flying in and out of uh, India, railways. among uh, the railways. So there are uh, lots of success stories. But most important, the neighborhood first policy has succeeded in protecting India's security interests. And I think the main message uh, that is coming out from this is that India's security is non-negotiable. That really is the bottom line. Because unless you do not ensure that, nothing else will move forward. Uh, so the only thing I would say as far as uh, your question is concerned is I think we should focus on better implementation mm -hmm. of decisions taken. So better implementation of projects. Maybe we should also be even more ambitious and even bolder in our approach when we talk about integration, you know, the use of the Indian rupee, integration of our financial markets, of our banking systems. Uh, we should do more of all that. And we should step up our contracts not just at the level of the prime ministers and presidents, but at the level of other ministers and the level of industry, business, students, professors, academia, media, journalists. Uh, you know, there is a whole universe out there and we must push, pursue these much more. Right. Ambassador, if we look at all our neighbors, especially SARC, and if we leave China aside, uh, our security concerns are uh, with primarily with Pakistan, Afghanistan and Myanmar. So, uh, how do we deal? What are the security challenges precisely? And yeah. how do we deal with them? So, it's a, it's a complicated uh, thing because there are many uh, layers to it. But I'll just try to reduce it to a uh, very simple kind of uh, indices that we can, or metric sure. we can measure. So, in Afghanistan, I will say basically there are three, four things. Number one, terror. Number two, inclusivity of internal governance of Afghanistan. That means the Taliban plus plus, it cannot only be the Taliban and, you know, because that will ensure some stability within Afghanistan. Number three, their respect for their own minorities, whether it is the Sikhs or the Hindus, because that affects us and we have a stake in that. And number four, our agenda with Afghanistan is going to remain connectivity to Afghanistan and through Afghanistan to Central Asia. So this is basically the Afghan agenda, uh, like a, a quick shot agenda for Afghanistan. But my number one priority will remain terrorism uh, and club with that radicalization and extremism. There's far too much going on in Afghanistan that uh, still 
is very uncomfortable for us. As far as Pakistan is concerned, I think again to summarize it very quickly, I think our main security challenges are they need a serious structural change within Pakistan. They need a big debate, an honest debate on their identity. They are still confused and they have not come to terms with who they are, how they fit into the South Asian region. Number three, terrorism. Of course, you know, Pakistan has been the hotbed of ter global terrorism uh, for the last maybe three decades. They have to take a serious uh, stock of uh, the direction they want to proceed in further. And lastly, I think also, I would say some aspects of their relationship with China are a serious threat to India. And this includes military cooperation, intelligence cooperation, nuclear cooperation, etc. With regard to Myanmar, I think, you know, because of its own internal fault lines, uh, cross-border insurgencies and the impact of uh, their ethnicities on, say, states like Nagaland or Arunachal Pradesh or Manipur, these are of serious concern to India. So the security of the Northeast is very closely linked to uh, secure and a peaceful border between India and Myanmar. And then uh, the other problem we have with Myanmar is how do we uh, adjust uh, the promotion of the values that India holds dear, which is democracy and human rights, with the realities of the domination of the military in the political and other life of Myanmar. That is a uh, policy dilemma which uh, we face. And lastly, again, as in Afghanistan, I would say connectivity is a big challenge. It's not just economic, but it's also going to contribute to security. And connectivity, which means basically connecting, say, uh, the Bay of Bengal to the northeast through the Myanmar uh, land route or connecting Bank uh, Thailand and uh, other Southeast Asian countries with the Indian northeast through, say, for example, the India-Myanmar-Thailand trilateral highway. So this is, in summary, I would say, uh, the main challenges. Ambassador Sarun, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that uh, India really moved mountains uh, during the COVID crisis and reached out to many countries, including those in the neighborhood. You've explained to us how India was the first responder in 2015 earthquake, and I saw it firsthand. I was there covering it. Uh, I would like to know that all these gestures that India has made, especially to uh, countries in its immediate neighborhood and uh, shown this love thy neighbor as thyself, <laughs> the biblical truth, uh, not just demonstrated it, gone beyond it. How has it helped India acquire the big brother image? No, I don't think we are a big brother at all and nor do we want to be. Uh, we just want to be an honest and a genuine partner in the region. And we would like that the, the economic growth and development of India as a nation can in some way contribute to the prosperity of our neighbors. And so if we can all grow together, I think that is most important for us and uh, grow together in a way in which we are also feeling very secure about each other that we do not threaten each other's core interests. I think that is really the uh, uh, approach I would like to uh, emphasize on rather than uh, viewing ourselves as a big brother. That is not the image or the objective of the neighborhood first policy. In fact, it is exactly the opposite. That if I can do something which is non-reciprocal for a smaller neighbor, I am ready to do it. So, for example, uh, let us even take in the case of COVID. I mean, you know, uh, between January and April of 2021, we granted or uh, sold about 19 million vaccine doses to our neighbors. And that really saved lives. We also allowed uh, and we provided uh, this uh, hydroxychloroquine medicine at that time when, you know, their own... Uh, systems were extremely fragile and overstrained. And we also sent doctors, we did online training 
for uh, their health uh, practitioners and um, the prime minister actually had a meeting online with all the leaders right. uh, and uh, then announced the creation of a sark covid emergency I fund if you remember you know and india put in 10 million dollars and the others put in also and therefore today the fund is worth about 20 million dollars uh, the only thing is pakistan did not contribute so you know uh, so uh, and in on the other hand when we were in trouble a lot of these same neighbors came to our rescue during the second wave you know they were some were gave us oxygen some provided different kinds of assistance to us so i think um, uh, what we would like to do is to uh, help them the neighbors to develop we would like to build a partnership which is based on trust and equality uh, non interference and also uh, as i said ensure that we are all safe secure and nothing happens which is uh, detrimental to either our security interests or their security interests ambassador sir could you please sum up for us key takeaways from uh, Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's recently concluded tour to India. Yeah, it, I think it was an excellent visit. I mean, you know, she came here after 2019, and I was told that uh, uh, during this visit, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Prime Minister Hasina uh, spent many hours together discussing uh, various issues on the agenda. So this personal chemistry between the two leaders. is a very valuable asset for the relationship and they have met so many times uh, in the past few years so the visit itself i think provided this excellent opportunity for them to sit down and discuss many many issues and uh, um, i think uh, what prime minister hasina has done for bangladesh's development and for the relationship with india is quite extraordinary so you know since her election in 2008 till today there have been so many breakthroughs in the relationship with india and this comes out of her personal commitment she believes that actually a good relationship with india is in bangladesh's interest and we have simply reciprocated and joined hands with her to do various things which in the past uh, were not possible to do or were unthinkable and uh, which is why in this period the rate of growth of the bangladesh economy and its own development has been the fastest it has ever had since 1971 so the point to be made here is that a good relationship with india is good for bangladesh's economic development and you know there are some iconic projects that she has uh, succeeded in implementing like the podda bridge it was a multi billion dollar project mm-hmm. so she has built that it was a huge engineering uh, feat and as a, a, a kind of a example of political determination so also in this visit i think uh, we have carried forward the various initiatives that were underway uh, but i would highlight one particular um, uh, outcome which related to the sharing of the kushiara river mm-hmm. in assam and silhet and i think that was a really good development because uh, it's important for us to move forward on water management not strictly water sharing but management of all the rivers because bangladesh is a river and country but this was a good example of uh, then on connectivity that's the other thing i would pick up that there have been so many developments energy road rail inland waterways coastal shipping uh, people to people uh, you name it we have it so the integration process is moving well and to the advantage of both sides and particularly bangladesh right. and so our northeast is getting better connected Mm-hmm. and lastly of course i was very happy to see that india has decided to invite bangladesh for the next g20 right. summit so you know it's it's very good right uh, ambassador how sustainable is this uh, this you know relationship between india and bangladesh uh, if a, a different regime comes in dhaka what will be the impact will it stay or will it collapse you know we have seen earlier there was a very hostile government in bangladesh towards india so have we institutionalized our bilateral relations and cooperation or it is still you know kind of vulnerable to political changes no i i think we will see what happens later right as focus on the present okay. instead of worrying about the future you know the important thing is to do what you can do today 
and i think we are institutionalizing a lot of the uh, initiatives that we are taking with bangladesh and therefore uh, from that point of view your your observation is very accurate and we want to make it sustainable so institutionalization sustainability and irreversibility and most importantly direct benefit to the common man on both sides so if you have popular support for what you're doing with bangladesh and within bangladesh then you know uh, that's all you need and uh, uh, of course the history has shown that we've had uh, very difficult phases also with bangladesh but uh, let us focus on the present and do our best uh, with honesty uh, with transparency and uh, taking into account uh, mutual interests and that is the way forward <coughs> ambassador saran we have touched upon uh, multifaceted dimensions of our relationships with uh, with our neighbors but uh, money makes the world go round Yeah. So, how do you look at the quantum of our trade with uh, our neighbors, and where do we need to improve? Yeah, you know, look. Firstly, when you look at trade figures, you know, a lot of the strategic experts uh, have made the point that South Asia is not integrated, that our trade levels are lower than other regional organizations, etc., etc. Uh, these are all valid points, but you know, trade is a function of the size of your economy. So if you have an economy which is of a smaller size then obviously whether it's a Nepal or a Bhutan or a Maldives there is only that much you can trade so we should not take absolute values and then draw conclusions that you know oh our trade is very small the trade is proportionate to the volume of your economy and so if you have a small economy and your global trade is therefore limited uh, it is a reality of life So having said that I think in the past 10 15 20 years our trade with each of our neighbors except Pakistan has grown significantly and the biggest change has come in the case of Bangladesh so last year we traded about 18 billion dollars with Bangladesh we have fairly big trade with Sri Lanka with uh, Nepal uh, and so uh, what we also need to do if we, when we talk of trade is to see how we can build value chains or supply chains which contribute to the economies of those countries so i can make something here i can export it there they process it and they re-export it so then i build a a full value chain the other thing i can do is promote investments uh, indian investments in those countries or their investments in india so again to lift up economic right. activity i can also remove barriers to trade which are on account of say poor infrastructure on the border i can improve my border infrastructure i can improve non tariff barriers to trade uh, which exist uh, on both sides i can i can focus on that mm -hmm. i can uh, uh, focus on for example um, trade in currencies which you know are easy for all our neighbors so for example with nepal and bhutan we trade in rupees so uh, there are uh, there are opportunities for uh, uh, for all sides uh, here but our philosophy today if i can summarize it is to focus on non reciprocal arrangements and to give market access to our smaller neighbors mm -hmm. to the indian market so that they prosper and benefit Uh, from that uh, uh, trade so for example even if your country like nepal you know the amount of hydro potential it has if it starts exporting that to india it can earn millions and millions of dollars right. so there are opportunities but i think we must continue to focus on uh, on building these convergences and interdependencies sure ambassador uh, sir uh, prime minister atul bihari vajpayee uh, once very famously said that you know you can change your friends but you cannot change your neighbors as a seasoned diplomat how do you see his observation in the indian context and what are the challenges major challenges for india which you see in your future yeah i think this is an accurate and 100% true what the prime minister vajpayee said uh, it is it is a it is it's a simple statement but it is full of implications and i think he said it in the context of pakistan you know when he was trying to 
uh, hold out the olive branch uh, to Pakistan in his belief, you know, that uh, uh, we can actually move forward even on Kashmir. You know, he said in Saniyat and Kashmiriyat. So uh, that was the context in which he said it. But uh, and that's how, you know, he took the political risk domestically of taking the bus and going to Lahore right. in 1999 uh, because of his belief that uh, you can't change your neighbors. But unfortunately, history has shown us that that philosophy was rebuffed, not once, but repeatedly. So uh, that is the basic challenge. And I think this uh, applies largely to the relationship with Pakistan. With regard to the other neighbors, uh, you know, we have never had these kind of problems with them. Uh, our approach is always to uh, build better relationships. And I think in the last uh, 10 odd years, we have made huge progress uh, with each of them. Uh, and uh, this is the way to go. That's the future. And we have to ensure that the region we live in uh, develops along with us that our prosperity becomes a source for their prosperity and that our security and their security are the same. There is no divergence or a contradiction between the two. And based on these basic uh, principles, uh, we should be able to move forward. So, dear viewers, uh, this was our discussion today on India and its neighborhood. As you can see, Although our neighbors are smaller than us, they are each very different in their identity, in their history, in their geography. And India tries to develop its relations with each of its neighbors based on the circumstances and peculiarities of their individual um, uh, parameters. With this in view, there is also the fact that the neighborhood first policy is an article of faith for the government and it has shown great success in the last few years and the potential is much much more so thank you for joining us we hope to bring you another topic next time to explain to you the indian perspective of some of the key regions of the world and till then thank you very much and namaskar